On today's show, the Mavs get the win against the Golden State Warriors. What happened? How did the Mavs get a win late? How did they respond in such resounding fashion? How did this make such a great win? We'll talk about that and more on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks. Now Bob Mavericks, NBA champion. Don't believe you shouldn't be here. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Angstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Locked On Maps. Your first listen today, where the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen to every show, leave a comment, like the video, leave a five star review, and tell me in the comment section below. What's one reason why the Mavs won this game? There's a bunch. It's a great team win for the Dallas Mavericks. And just tell me one in the comment section below, one reason. This episode is brought to you by Price Picks. Easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to pricepicks.com slash LockdownNBA. Use the code LockdownNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. The Mavs get the win. Luka Doncic goes off for 39, 10 assists in this one, 29 shots for Luka. Still made it look, I guess, pretty easy, or at least was efficient enough. Made it happen in the clutch for sure. But I want to start with this because the Mavs, this is a great team win. One of the goals for this season is for the Mavericks, at least one that I've been harping on over and over and over again. At this juncture, I've been Derek harping on this over and over again. The Mavs need to figure out what Luka and Kyrie are going to be. And Kyrie is on the verge of coming back. He was doubtful coming into this game and not just straight up out. So it looks like he could play in the Mavs next game. I think Brad Townsend reported that he could come back uh, – for the Jazz game on Monday, or if not, then very likely the Trailblazers game at home on Wednesday. And that starts a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 game homestand for the Dallas Mavericks. So that's good. So they'll be starting back on figuring out that goal again, hopefully soon. The second goal I've had for the Mavericks is to figure out who's going to be ready to go. Who's going to be ready to go next season for a title run? The Mavs have the opportunity to make a big move this summer. I knew that they weren't going to make a move like the Knicks just did for OG and Anobi during this season. They just don't have the stuff to do it right now. Despite what maybe you've seen on Twitter or other places, I don't think the Mavericks have it, have the stuff. Emmanuel quickly was much more valuable than I think any player besides maybe Derek Lively that the Mavericks have as a young player that they would be willing to part with maybe. But the Mavs aren't going to make that kind of a move yet. But what I think that they will do is try and make a little bit of a push this year, make a small move around the edges. I think that some kind of trade will happen this year. But I think the Mavericks need to figure out who on this team is ready to go next season. Who can you look at and say, well, Tim Hardaway Jr., are you ready to go? We talked about that yesterday. You can check out the show if you're interested more in that. Dante Exum, are, are you ready to go? I think we've pretty much answered that question in like a 10-game span. Josh Green, what about you? Would you be ready to contribute? Uh, you know, Derek Lively, are you ready to contribute? There's just so many guys down the list. Derek Jones Jr., Jaden Hardy. Omax, are you guys ready to make some kind of a run next year and contribute in some way, shape, or form? So as much as this game against the Warriors was a good win, Luka Doncic you know, figuring it out in the clutch and, and just making it happen and closing it out, the Mavs got so many contributions from a bunch of different players in this one. You've got to love it. Dante Exum, mentioned him, 19 points, 5 assists. He was 8 of 12 in the field, hit three threes. He's just such a decisive and smart player. The way that he can get the ball, and doesn't like hold it and look around and try and figure out what's it feels like he's always moving. Even his dribbling. It feels like when he dribbles, he kind of like does the the my player in 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 like a, or like the choose your character thing on Mortal Kombat where you like you pick your character and that player has that weird like just kind of they're like kind of moving up and down. Just this little like feels like they're pulsing, like just up and down a little bit, like swaying up and down. Feels like even when Dante XM is dribbling in place, he's kind of just like moving up and down, constantly moving, always on the go, always making a quick decision. And he made some real quick decisions in this game and some drives that just really helped the Mavericks, threes that really helped the Mavericks, and he took them decisively. Dante Exum has not been a good three-point shooter in the NBA. He has come in, and that's why teams have left him alone. He has come in, and he helped his shot in EuroLeague. He really worked on it. He came back, and he has not hesitated to take those threes. And I think that's so big and so crucial for somebody like that to not have that kind of a skill, come in the NBA, and that be a skill that was sort of his swing skill. If he's going to be a really good impact player for the Mavericks, he had to hit some threes. And he comes in, and he's like, I'm just going to take them. And a couple of them, a couple threes that he took in this game, what is he, 305, 
at least two of them, maybe three that I saw, were clear. I can take this three if I want to. It's maybe not our best shot. Dante Exum's thinking this in his head. It's maybe not our best shot, but Derek Lively's right under the rim. Or Grant Williams is right under the rim. Luca is right under the rim. My teammates have a clear path to getting this rebound. I'm just going to chuck it up anyway. I love those kind of threes because you, you see Dante Exum make the decision. He looks at Derek Lively, and then he looks at the rim and goes, well, I'm just going to throw it up because if I miss this, Derek Lively you know, likely is going to get this rebound. And I love those types of things. You can just see the decision-making in his head as it's going in real time. Really great game from Dante Exum and one turnover. Five assists, one turnover. He played 30, almost 34 minutes. And I think he was a big catalyst in the Mavs' non luka minutes. You had the second quarter, the beginning of the second quarter run, where the Mavs went on an 11-0 run. They ended up winning those minutes against the Warriors 15-12 to to start the second quarter. That's huge. The Mavs just need to win those minutes without Luka. They need to at least to stay afloat. In the fourth quarter, they went 7-7, seven and seven, so they stayed afloat in those. But that means that they won the non luka minutes. Overall, what did they win? Uh, what was it? 22 to 19. They won those minutes. It's only by three points, but still, to win those minutes without Luka Doncic on a team where in the past we'd look at teams that, that were on Luka and go, they just have no shot. They just got to stay like within five or ten when Luka gets off the floor so that he can come back and cook. Exum is been a, has been a huge catalyst for that, for leading those minutes, for being an extra ball handler. He can be a secondary. He can be a primary. You can put him in a bunch of different – he can be a spot-up shooter. He can be a bunch of different things. And he brings it on the defensive end too. He was chasing around guys. He was chasing Curry around a lot of the time. He was chasing Clay around. Clay Thompson went one of 11, right? Yeah, one of 11, one of six from three in this game. And Exum was on him at, you know, t- from time to time. To have that type of player, it's just a home run – for Nico Harrison and this Mavs front office, that they got somebody like this, that they needed one of those. The Mavs needed one of these home runs. We got this guy for almost nothing, and he's contributing because they just haven't had him the last couple of years. Last couple of years, they've had these players where you go, man, they kind of invested in this guy, and he's really not panning out that much, you know. Like, and so to get somebody where you get somebody that's found money, right? Exum has found money. The other found money guy I think that contributed that's probably not going to get talked about a lot today is Derek Jones Jr. Only seven points, five rebounds, two steals. He had a blocked shot, didn't make any of his threes. And you go, all right, that's not like his best game. He didn't score 20 points again. We've seen him score 20 points a bunch this season. But he was the one guarding Steph Curry. Steph Curry finished the game 9 of 25. That's 36%. He hit six of his 15 threes because he's just insane. But only 25 points for Steph. Holding him to that, I thought Derrick Jones Jr. did a great job of just chasing it around, making his life hard for him. That's the only thing you can do against Steph Curry is just chase him around, be there, be, like have the long arm in his face and just try to make his shot just a little bit more difficult and a higher degree of difficulty. He was taking some tough shots in this game. And Derrick Jones Jr. also had that steal on Steph Curry that Luka saved. That was the at 2 minutes and 15 seconds. He, he poked the ball away from Steph Curry. Lucas saved the ball. Then Tim Hardaway Jr. hits a leaning jumper. They go back up by nine with, like, less than two minutes to go. That, that, to me, was the one where it really pushed the game kind of out of reach, not fully out of reach for the Warriors because when you have Steph Curry, when you're within nine, you're within three shots. And Reggie Miller hit eight points in nine seconds. So I, I believe Curry can do that <laughs> as well in a game if it called for it. But Derek Jones Jr., another – Game where he just made an impact, I thought, even though he didn't score as much, even though he didn't, he doesn't have like the box score that really stands out. I thought he made a big impact. And then coming up, let's talk about Josh Green because Josh Green, welcome back. Great game for him in this one. He had uh, 18 points, third leading score on the Mavericks. How did he make an impact? What about Derek Lively? Did he make a big impact in his role? We'll talk about that and more coming up. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. You can go to prizepicks.com, and all you have to do is pick more or less on the projections of players. You don't have to play against all these professionals and all these guys that all they do is sit in their basement like this one and try and like figure out who's going to be the best play for that night and put things together. And they got algorithms, and it's like they've got those Bitcoin servers that are just running through stuff. Go to Prize Picks like I am right now, and we've got a let's see what is a good what's a good matchup it feels like. It's hard to sometimes find. Uh, well, let's go Orlando versus Phoenix. Devin Booker, 26 and a half points. Oh, give me more on that one. Orlando's a good d- defensive team, but I'll get I'll take more on Devin Booker. They've needed to prove some stuff. Nurkic, 12 and a half points. Give me less on that one. 
for Nurkic. And then I'll take Paolo Bancaro, 23 and a half points. Oh, come on. More on that one for sure. If I put down 20 bucks on those three plays and I hit all of them, I can win 100 bucks if I add Kevin Durant, 25 and a half. Yeah, give me more on Kevin Durant. And if I do that, I put down 10 bucks, I can win. Uh, you can win 100 bucks on that as well. And so check it out at prizepicks.com. Use the code locked on NBA, all lowercase, locked on NBA. Get a deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Locked On Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad. I'm traveling right now with family here, and I just appreciate each and every one of you for making trips like this happen for me uh, to be able to make this happen and that you guys still continue to support the show. Appreciate each and every one of you. If you want to support the show further, subscribe to the subtext when I get back from the trip. It'll be on full blast. I'll be sending game updates. I'll answer questions. I'll do mailbags. I'll do film reviews and all that kind of stuff. Love the Subtext community. Love getting to talk to you guys one-on-one. So subscribe to Subtext. Get text from me straight to your phone. And you can one-on-one text with me on that one as well. Um, text the number or click the link in the description. All right, Isaac, let's get into this game. Josh Green, huge impact. 18 points in this one. How many did he have at halftime? He, he, he had 10 points at, in the first half. He hit a couple of threes. He also had a couple of assists as well. He was just aggressive. He's what Josh Green, the Josh Green that we've wanted to see, is the Josh Green that takes the ball from like when he first checked into the game. He gets the ball, he drives, and he hits a, a he hits a jumper, and then he runs out in transition, and Luca finds him, and then boom, he hits another dunk, and you're just like, yes, this is the Josh Green we wanted to see. Decisive threes. He's learning from Dante Exum. I feel like he's taking the Dante Exum decisiveness, and he's like, all right, I gotta look at my fellow Aussie and take that into consideration and really just be aggressive. And when he is on offense, he's helpful on defense. He was chasing around Curry. He was chasing around Clay. He was chasing around uh, Brandon Pajemski that had a really good game in this one. Great to see Josh Green get back and to have 18 points, which I believe it's definitely his, his season high um, for him. And he did it in, he did it really efficiently. Six of eight from the field, three of four from three, hit three free throws as well. Really great game for Josh Green. Love to see that. Hopefully this gets him back into a rhythm. This is why I've never really given up on Josh Green yet. He's still super young. He's like 22, 23 years old, and still trying to figure out his way into this into this roster. He's like in the Andre Iguodala mold, where it's going to take a little while for him to figure out how he exactly fits in this roster. And that's why we go back to my original point. The Mavs need to figure out who's ready. What kind of role can Josh Green play on a playoff team? If he's hitting threes like this, if he's being decisive, if he's playing defense like this, he can absolutely play a role off the bench if the Mavericks want him to be that. And the Mavs now all of a sudden have a couple of these wings here that are really showing out, and that's real positive for the Mavericks that they've got some of these options, especially Derek Jones Jr., Josh Green, Exum, that can all play on small guards because that's not something the Mavericks have been really good at in the past. Um, And so that's something that I think has been great. Josh Green, great to see him come back. Awesome execution from him. Derek Lively. Let's talk about D-Live. 12 points, 14 rebounds. No block shots, but he definitely altered a bunch of shots at the rim. Only two fouls in this game. Had one assist. And he had the one turnover we'll talk about in a second. But he outplayed Trace Jackson Davis. For the many of you that have said, can the Mavericks get Kevon Looney? Can they trade for Kevon Looney in the – like they're – in the past, Kevon Looney has been benched. He's fully been benched for Trace Jackson Davis. He has played that well. Trace Jackson Davis had 17 and uh, six in this game. I mean, he just is making an impact for this Warriors team. And Derek Lively went up against him. I think outplayed him. Definitely out rebounded him at times. Defended at the rim and blocked some of his shots and that they, he didn't get credit for apparently. And I just love to see Derek Lively learn in some of these moments. He's had he had a couple learning moments in this game for all the good that he brought. He had the moment in the second quarter, I thought, when he was out there against Dario Saric. And Saric is not your back-to-the-basket, he's not your pick-and-roll type of big. He is your spread-the-floor, face-up, drive-at-somebody kind of big. And Derek Lively hasn't really defended to those guys a lot this season. And so for him to be out there, to try and like hedge and be in the paint, and then all of a sudden have to run out and transition or run out and to, to close out, I thought he had... Uh, it was something to, something for, for him to learn. And I thought Kidd left him out there a little bit longer just to see how he would. Because Kidd could, could have put out Dwight Powell out there. And Dwight Powell knows how to defend those situations. Derek Lively has not seen that look very often. The five-out the five out offense where the, the, you know, the, the center can shoot the three. I thought that was really interesting. That was definitely a learning moment. He struggled against that, although the Mavs did win those minutes. So you'll take that. 
The other moment was in the fourth quarter when he's he has the ball at the top of the key and he's looking around. Two minutes and 44 seconds left. Chris Paul steals the ball from him, hits a three, and it's a five-point game, which is what made this a clutch game, I think, uh, at that point. And that was a big learning moment, too, where all of a sudden you go, oh, man, that's a rookie mistake. He just holds the ball. He's, he's holding the ball. He's, like, in the – uh, the triple threat move like with the ball in both hands, but his elbows out. And Chris Paul, just you saw him on the – if you saw the replay or you at least saw the highlight of it, you saw the angle from the Warriors basket. And you saw like right down the lane, and you could see Chris Paul's eyes just like get real big when, when Derek Lively exposed that ball when he turned to the right. And then all of a sudden he just poked it free, grabbed the ball, and then the Warriors came up with a Chris Paul three on the other end. Chris Paul, by the way, has not been shooting the ball well at all. Went six uh, – you know, what did he finish with? A six of nine, nice, from three in this game. <laughs> just, just one of those games where you go, hey, man, he's going to make him eventually. If you keep leaving him open, he's just going to hit him. But some learning moments for Derek Lively, and he's back to, all right, this is exactly what I said against the Cavs and against the Timberwolves. Derek Lively is going to look good against these teams like this where they don't have a center that's going to that's gonna dominate, that has been an all-star in the past, that is a really good – defensive offensive center either way he's gonna look good against teams like this and raise the Mavericks floor he's gonna struggle against some of the, the best centers in the NBA of course of course he is and so this is something to continue to watch but the Mavericks floor is raised so he plays well against a team like this and you love to see it and you love to see that continue to be true talked about Derek Lively talked about Josh Green haven't really talked too much about Luca. Because I thought this was more of like a team win, but man, 39 points, 10 assists in this game. Uh, he hit six of seven of his free throws. He missed one of them late that didn't really matter because the Mavs already had this game. But I just want to look at the last like th- basically four minutes for the Mavericks. The Mavs have that moment where the Warriors are starting to come back. And the Mavs did a great job in this game of responding every single time the Warriors went on some kind of run, whether they tried to cut it to – you know, f- tried to cut it to five or six or tried to cut the lead down. Every time they got that, the Mavs found a way to push the lead back out. One of those moments was in the fourth quarter, about four minutes left. Luka hits a one-on-one fadeaway jumper to uh, stretch the lead back to 11. And then that Chris, then a couple minutes later, that Chris Paul, he steals from Derek Lively, hits that three. It's a five-point game. And then immediately after that, you're like, all right, it's a five-point game. The Mavs have to do something. They have to get the ball in the basket. You have to score your best. Jason Kidd has said their best defense is their is a good offense and a solid offense. It doesn't turn the ball over, doesn't take bad shots, doesn't lead to long rebounds, it doesn't lead to transition. Because the Mavericks, I saw this stat today for I think it was from NBA University, 16th in half court defense. They have a pretty decent half court defense. Their transition defense is bad, so you just don't want to lead to that many transition opportunities. And so Luca, out of that out of that moment where you know the Warriors cut it to five with like two and a half minutes left. He just runs in, draws a foul. He can just do it against anybody. Now, you could tell, you could say it's foul baiting, but if the refs are going to give it to him, and Luca has, throughout the game, worked and kind of tried to figure out exactly and weigh, weigh what kind of fouls and what kind of things the refs are calling. He learns it. At 2.30, he draws the foul. He hits both of his free throws, clutch, and he extends the lead back to well, that's seven at that point. Then you have the moment where Derek Jones Jr. pokes the ball away from Steph Curry. Luca saves the ball out of bounds, a hustle play that leads to Tim Hardaway Jr. with a leading jumper. Lead goes back to nine. And then right after that, I think the Warriors took a timeout and then <laughs> Kuminga fouls Luca on an inbound. Mavs get into the bonus. Luca hits his two free throws again. And you're like, all right, it's just deja vu over and over again. The Warriors try to try to come back and Luca finds a way to respond. It felt like a very mature game from Luca to me. Uh, he called his number a bunch. He took 29 shots for sure in this game. He got he was off the game before, so he was able to to put in that much effort and energy. He only played 37 minutes, which is not as many as he's had to play in some of these games in the past. But again, 10 assists, only four turnovers, 39 points for Luca. An amazing game for him. An amazing game for an NBA player, but not necessarily an amazing game for him. I just felt like it was a mature, solid game where he just closed out this Warriors team. You love to see it. The responses from this team were great. Just great poise overall. You saw this team work together well. Uh, Grant Williams, I think, has responded well being put on the bench. He had 10 points, hit two of his threes, six rebounds. He had a couple of, like, play, a couple of, like, heads-up plays where, you know, Sarge went up for a, a layup and Grant got hit in the face a little bit by his elbow and he sold the call and then the Warriors fans and all the bench was booing him. But 
He still uh he still got the foul call. Just some just some heady moves. He only played 19 minutes in this game. I felt like this Warriors team would have been a better matchup for him, but the Mavs have had these guys that have just played better. Like these are the guys that played more minutes than Grant Williams. Uh Lively, I, Luca obviously, Derek Lively obviously. Exum, Tim Hardaway, Josh Green, Derek Jones Jr., and then Jaden Hardy too. I think we could talk about him. But Grant Williams is is playing a fine role right now. He just hasn't really jumped into that next level that we thought he would. Uh, and I think that's fine. I think that it's fine as long as the Mavericks get contributions from the guys that are ahead of him, right? <laughs> that's that's going to be the question. Jaden Hardy started in this game. A lot of people thought that was interesting. This is what Kid wants to do. Kid does this all the time. He'll take the guy that's like third on the depth chart or whatever and leapfrog him over Tim Hardaway, over – you know, uh, Grant Williams or somebody else because he wants to keep the roles that the guys have. He wants to keep bringing Tim Hardaway Jr. off the bench. He wants to keep bringing Grant Williams off the bench so that when Kyrie comes back, he just slides right into that spot that Jaden Hardy was playing, and then boom, you're ready to go at that point. And so I wasn't, I was not surprised by that at all. Uh, he hit, a, he hit one three. It was that corner three that the Mavericks really needed in the fourth quarter in transition. That was with about five minutes to go. And I thought that was a good play for him after he had missed the other four threes that he had taken. He had a couple of other, like, little drive shot. He had a layup that he ran out in transition and got. He had a couple other jumpers. And he he didn't have a huge game, but he contributed here and there. He only played 23 minutes, so he was a good spot filler. But Exum and Josh Green and Tim Hardaway really filled that spot and that scoring that the Mavericks needed in this game. We talked about Tim Hardaway Jr. yesterday. I spent most of the show yesterday talking about, did the Mavericks need to trade Tim Hardaway down the road do they need to look at Tim Hardaway and say all right you got to either give us something more or we've got to trade you for a different skill set that we'll need down the road and one of the things that I did was I compared him to Jamal Crawford Lou Williams Jordan Poole some of these guys that we've looked at in the past and said these are super subs the sixth man the scorers off the bench can Tim Hardaway be one of those guys and I mentioned all four of all three of those guys averaged four assists a game like almost exactly and J- Jason Terry Average almost three and a half to four assists a game for their career. And Tim Hardaway averaged like 1.6 this season for the Mavericks and not many assists for his career. Tim Hardaway went out, had 16 points and four and five assists. It's almost as if he listened to Lockdown Mavs yesterday and said, all right, bet. If you need me to play make a little bit more and pass out of what I've got, be a little bit more uh, unselfish, then I'll go do that. He had five assists in this game. And it was just a great response from him just to to make the right play. And I think this season he has made the right play. I'm not trying to say that he doesn't make the right plays or the right basketball plays. He does force some shots. He calls his own number. But I thought in this game he didn't as much. Only 12 shots, which is low for him, same amount as as Exum had. And then the five assists, great playmaking, finding guys. The Mavs were really unselfish with the ball tonight. It's like they almost looked at what the Warriors did and said, all right, we're going to try to do a little bit more of that. They had 25 assists as a team in this one. So, Tim Hardaway Jr., great. I thought a, a pretty good, a pretty solid game. The Mavs definitely needed his scoring off the bench, needed that playmaking a little bit. He had six rebounds, too, which I thought every time Tim gets a rebound, it feels like a big rebound. Maybe it's just because he grabs it and he just thrusts it back and forth to make sure that everyone knows, everyone knows that he got the that he got it. Um, I'll spend the last couple of minutes talking about the – talking about the um, – the, the trade for OG Ananobi. So, the Knicks get OG Ananobi. They trade away – Emmanuel quickly, R.J. Barrett, only a second-round pick. Doesn't seem like a lot for O.G. Ananobi when we've been told, oh, it's going to take multiple picks, three picks, three first-round picks to get O.G. Ananobi. I was worried that the Knicks were going to – for the, on the Knicks side, I was worried that they were going to send, like, two firsts with Emmanuel quickly, and I was like, I was going to be like, oh, my gosh. To me, it seems like a marginal upgrade for the Knicks, if it is an upgrade, because you're upgrading, obviously, from R.J. Barrett to O.G. Ananobi. That's an upgrade. You'll take that. The defense is – Definitely better. Le- probably leaps and bounds better. The offense is better when it comes to spot up shooting, but I don't know that it's that much of an upgrade when it comes to creation on offense. And then you lose Emmanuel quickly, where he's been really, really good for them this season. the The lineups with Brunson and Emmanuel quickly have been very good. Emmanuel quickly is one of the best on off players this season, and the Knicks. One of their strengths has been their bench units with Emmanuel quickly and Josh Hart and Dante Dante Divincenzo and uh, Isaiah Hartenstein, like they have been a very good bench and they've outplayed guys and outscored teams. And now you take away completely that strength of yours. You strengthen the front, the, the starting lineup a little bit. 
and you lose that. They also lost Mitchell Robinson for the season. So Isaiah Hardenstein comes from off the bench to a, as, to a starter. Taj Gibson now becomes your backup center. And I'm, I'm looking at this team going, man, I just feel like they lost one of their superpowers. And I thought that about the, the Grizzlies this summer when – when I when Steven Adams went down and you know Brandon Clark's going to be out and you're like man they just feel like they lost their rebounding superpower and I feel like the Knicks it's kind of the same thing here that bench was one of their powers where they just knew that they could come in and trust that bench to not lose leads but even like build on leads at times so I'm worried about that I'm curious what what they think about that I love this for the Raptors because the Raptors I thought were going to lose OG and Nobi anyway he's going to be a, a free agent this summer I thought that the Mavericks could maybe get in on an OG and Nobi trade if they were going to uh, do a sign in trade of some kind. They could have done that. But instead, they get Emmanuel quickly. I think he's going to be great for them. He's going to take that step up. And honestly, I think they have a Jalen Brunson situation on their hands because I think he's going to take a step up into his role. He's going to start scoring a lot more, playing a lot more, looking like more of that leader that they need. And the Knicks are going to look at him and be like, did we just do the same thing that the Mavericks did with Brunson? Now, the difference between those situations is the Knicks actually got a player for him. The Mavericks didn't get any players for Jalen Brunson. This OG and Anobi trade is actually a trade that the Mavericks wanted to do when they had Jalen Brunson and wanted to trade him, but they just couldn't really get anything done. They couldn't figure anything out. Uh, did, I don't think they had an R.J. Barrett type that they could add in a trade, and there wasn't. There just wasn't an opportunity for the Mavs to make that type of trade. And also, I think Jalen Brunson showed less when he was with the Mavericks and the Mavs wanted to trade him than Emmanuel quickly has shown so far in his NBA career. So if you want to go revisionist history on it, oh, why didn't the Mavericks do this OG and Anobi trade back when they had Brunson? Like, I don't think Brunson was as valuable as Emmanuel Quickly is right now because I don't think he was as good or showed as much. So that's my thoughts on that. The Mavs, it, it takes it takes a, a player off the board as far as trades, and so the Knicks still can make another move. They've got more picks. They've got Julius Randle's contract. That you know they've got a bunch of stuff they can still do. And so I think there's still a, a trade. There, there's still a player in trades for sure. But it takes a player off the board that the Mavericks may have been, you know, may have been interested in, and we'll see what happens. But yeah, there you go. That's what I think about OG and Obi. That's what I think about Mavs versus Warriors. Let me know in the comment section what's one reason why the Mavs won this game. I'm excited about it. One more game this weekend uh, against the who are they, who are they playing next? They're <laughs> they're playing the Jazz on Monday. There will be no uh, Sunday night show going into Monday, but there will be a post game after the Jazz game. So guys, thanks so much for listening to Lockdown Mavs. Peace out. Boom.